So you want to be a picture book writer, then you got to write picture books. And you're going to need a bucket load of bright ideas for titles, plots, and hooks. If you're partial to prose or you're raring to rhyme, then repeat after me. It's a challenge, but I'm going to tackle each story one month at a time with 12 by 12. And also, I wanted to point out the end papers. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones at the beginning, and you see May and Sophia. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then at the end, you know, the letter writing and so on. Yeah. And then ultimately, we see, eh, I have to figure out where my finger is here. Um, <laughs> ultimately, see, we see that she has indeed made a new friend. So. New friend. Yeah. I love how this book uses every single piece of real estate to help tell this story. And of course, the illustrations are beyond beautiful. So you have kind of an interesting story on what inspired you to write this book. Uh, yes. Share yeah. that with us. Yeah. Before I go into that, I'm so glad that you noticed all the differences and little detail on an end paper because that's what I noticed too. And then I thought, oh, she has did such a great job just including all this little detail to make the story so amazing. Yes. Actually, I started this story as my own way of processing a lot of things in my mind at the time. And I was ruminating on the meaning of trust in friendship. And I also was thinking about changes that happened in an unexpected way and changes that were out of my control. And I think that one of the most difficult changes would be parting with loved ones or um, close friends. So one day I sat down to process all my thought. Then I had this image of two friends who meet every day through an open door and created this routine that is unique to them. Then something happened and the dynamic changes with the one friend moving away. So I started a draft from a perspective of a friend who is left behind. And later my editor thought that that was an interesting take rather than from the perspective of a friend who is living. And then later on, I used a single stem of sagas, the one that you saw in a book as an inspiration, one of inspiration and as a symbol of friendship and a trust and hope. Uh, so I I remember the day the probably you guys saw in a, my book the single stem of sawgrass but it shows in a book too so I still remember very vividly vividly the day I spotted the single stem of sawgrass it, I remember feeling a little unsettled and uneasy about all the changes that happened that day so I was out in my beggar just to get some warm sun and then I spotted this single stem of sawgrass right away. And it was such a delightful sight that it just made me smile internally. But then I had just two questions. First, why did it decide to grow that way? And why did it show up that way in front of me? Of course, I had no answers. But then I noticed how it grew through the like a fence wall of separation and connecting my yard and my neighbor's yard. And it seems to me like a manifesting the nature's wonders way of making the impossible possible. And I just felt a lot better. So I named it hope. And wow. then I just took it as a sign from nature telling me that everything will be okay. So that I knew that there was a story in it, but didn't know how to proceed. But then that image stayed with me for a long time and prompt me um, to start a draft. Yeah. Wow. That's how I started. That's amazing. And I love how this one image, just in all of this contemplation of different mm -hmm. things, you know, not sitting down and thinking, oh, I'm going to write a story about X. But one of the things that we talk about a lot in 12 by 12 and just about picture book writing in general is having it come from the heart. Because if it does, if it comes from a place that is deep within your heart, it is certain to resonate with others, you know, maybe not everybody, but definitely. And there's so much heart in this book with the friendship. And the other thing I noticed, and I'm not even sure if 
you did this intentionally or not. So I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. because the plant being called sour grass, but then there's this uh, play with, I'm trying to find it here. Let's see between, oh yeah, between sweet and sour. And for them, it became the sweetest plant ever. So even though it's called sour grass, it's sweet. And there's a few, there were three different places where this contrast between sweet and sour happens. And to me, that's also a metaphor of not just nature, but also our lives. We have both sweet and sour and they're both valid and they both, you know, they can, you know, it's, I, I don't know if you saw that movie Inside Out, but it's like joy and sadness, you know, when they're mixed together, it makes everything all the more profound. Yeah, I think that you said it really beautifully, actually. That's how I feel about life, too. It's a mix of sadness and happiness. And then in the even happiest moment, there's a sadness. And then in the saddest moment, you know, there's a sense of hope and a gleam of light. Actually, that's not what I said. I heard uh, from an interview with Yoyoma and Yoyoma said that. And I was like, ah, that's how I feel, too. But Sourgrass, actually, the name captures the nature of a friendship, I think, between these two friends, because they created this really beautiful shared memories. But then those memories will not last forever. And then all of a sudden, it kind of stopped. So it, there's this bittersweetness. And whenever I think of some memories, I feel like nostalgia or bittersweetness because they only exist in you know, in the past, and they're not going to be replicated. So, so I actually use the word color twice in this book um, to capture how the sadness of Sophia when May left. So when May leaves, it said, then one colorless day, May moved away. So reflecting the state of mind of Sophia and how sad she was. So before that, her world was full of colors you know, really captured brilliantly by Shaz, like lots of spring colors. But then um, the day when May leaves, it feels like there's no color. So it's a colorless day. But then after she gets a letter from May, but then the letter stops coming, showing the changes in a relationship or, you know, there's some changes. And then Sophia is having a hard time dealing with that. But then so I use color here too, but after some time, as the colors faded in the yard, the mailbox became quiet too. So because I sometimes feel like the memories faded with a passage of time, and then the seasonal change can be also captured with the colors fading. So I used specifically the word colors to capture the relationship and the emotional state of Sophia. So yes, and... I feel like Shaz captured the bittersweetness of memories and relationship with her illustration so well. Yeah. It's so much so it, because it's so dramatic because the book otherwise is so bright and joyful and the yellows and the oranges. And then on those spreads that you mentioned, there's still color there, but it's muted and there's a lot of gray all of a sudden. Right, um, right. You know, and she's not outside. And one thing I loved is that you can see that she's not outside because of the wind. You can see the little bit of the window pane mm -hmm. there and the mailbox, you know, she's sort of looking at it from a distance. There's just, there's so much in this book. And so... Sourgrass is, I, I had no idea hmm. before I read this book what sourgrass was or where it grew or anything. And I I didn't even want to go look it up and see the real thing after I read this because I wanted to keep this image that, from your book. But is this what it actually looks like? These fields of sourgrass? Yeah, actually, it's very yellow. I wish I had a photos. Actually, I took some photos of sourgrass every spring because it. I think last spring I took some photo and posted my Instagram, and then another uh, I posted another um, 
photos on my Instagram this year. So sauerkraut is a yellow wildflower that pops up everywhere in San Francisco in spring. And it has a couple of other names like Apsalis, meaning sour, and Woods Roll. And I learned that it grows in many parts of America and even around the world. And a week ago, I learned that it also grows in Korea. And it has a funny name in Korea. It's called Bonengi Bap, which means cat food, because if you believe that cats will nibble on them when they have a problem with the digestion. Yeah, but then it belongs to a family of plants called Sarangcho, which meaning flower of love. So I thought that was really lovely. Uh, but it's edible wild plants. You can eat all of them, roots and flower and uh, leaves, you know, stems. And they can help you cure if you have fever, <laughs> nausea, or sore throat. But the, the I learned about the sawgrass for the first time when my kids were in preschool. We had this community garden behind the preschool, and they'll just go there. And then, you know, just like books, chew on the stems of a sawgrass and giggle. And I remember that day very clearly. Someone was above them and they're all laughing together. That was my, uh, one of my favorite image from the era. So I used that image in my story. It's a challenge, but I'm going to tackle each story one month at a time with 12 by 12.